busy for the moment because I've got a job for you. The crime I'm taking this week is one of those borderline cases. So often when the foreman of the jury rises to give the verdict, you know exactly what he's going to say. It's a foregone conclusion. In this case, it's not so easy to foretell. Music, murder, and the Macintosh I've chosen as a title. Music was only one of the cultured interests of William Herbert Wallace. He was a naturalist, he'd been a political agent, he was a prominent member of the Liverpool Central Chess Club. The wife he'd chosen of a slightly higher social position than his own had intellectual leanings too. She painted in watercolour, she talked fluent French, she was an accomplished pianist. The piano stood in the front parlour of a little house in a Liverpool street, and there was spent some of the happiest evenings of a happy married life, which in January 1931 had lasted 18 years. For both the Wallaces had reached the respectable age of 52. Herbert may sometimes have felt that his job as a collector for an insurance company was unworthy of him. If he did so, he smothered his discontent and came home at the end of the day to Julia and our little front parlor where, with much careful practice, and under Julia's expert guidance, he could explore the sunlit world of Beethoven and Mozart. Pretty good. And it's perfect, dear. Uh, perhaps the liquor could be a little more sustained. I expect you're right. Shall we try again? Tomorrow's Sunday and on Monday we won't be able to practice. I don't know, dear. It's your test night. It's the championship. I've got a match to play. Then we'd better take it through once more. Maybe, dear. Monday, the 19th of January, came. And an all-important telephone call was made from a call box in the street, some 400 yards from the Wallace home. Billy Cafe, Liverpool Central Chess Club. Can I speak to Mr. Wallace? I'm afraid he hasn't come in yet. I'm the captain of the club. Can you ring later? No, I'm too busy. I've got the girl's 21st birthday and I want to see Mr. Wallace. There's something in the nature of his business. Well, can I give him a message? Well, will you tell him that Mr. R.M. Qualtrough, Q-U-A-L-T-R-O-U-G-H, Qualtrough, called, number 25, Menlock Garden East. Will you ask him to come and see me tomorrow evening at 7.30? The uh, captain of the club didn't know the voice. He afterwards described it as a strong voice, rather gruff, confident, sure of itself. He was rather good judge, natural. He went back to what he was doing, and about half an hour later, noticed that Wallace had arrived and was deep in play. Boy, Wallace, hmm? I have a message for you. Huh? Telephone message from Mr. Qualtro. Qualtro, Qualtro, your move. I don't know anyone of that name. He wants to see you tomorrow evening at 7.30. Something in the nature of your business. I've written it down. Number 25, Men Love Gardens East. Hmm. Is it Men Love Avenue? I'll see if anyone in the club knows. I'm not sure I'll go. Not at all, sure. Sorry, my move. But he did go. Yes, unfortunately, he did. It was soon after six that he got home from his work. But uh, let's hear his own account. Julia was in when I got home and we had our tea together. She had a cold. I got a lot of papers together, forms which I thought I might want for Mr. Qualtrough. And everything finished. Only one other person saw Julia alive that evening. That was the milk boy when he delivered the milk. He called about half past six, he said. But some of his little friends who saw him making his round put it as late as a quarter to seven. About six minutes past seven, Mr. Wallace boarded the tram. Does this tram go from Menlock Gardens East? No, it don't. You can go on a number five. I'm a stranger in this district. I have some important business in Menlock Gardens East. And so it went on. He told the second tram conductor that he was a complete stranger in those parts. He volunteered to a clerk whom he had stopped to ask the way that he had a call to make at number 25. He rang the bell at 25, Men Love West, and asked in vain for Mr. Qualtrough. He asked as a news agent if he might consult the directory. He stopped a policeman and told him he was an insurance agent and looking for Mr. Qualtrough. He asked the policeman the time and learned it was now a quarter to eight. But he never found number 25, Men Love Gardens East, or Mr. Qualtrough, or, strangely enough, 
There was no such place, nor possibly any such person. Hello, this is Ray. At a quarter to nine, the Wallace's next door neighbors, an engineer and his wife, saw Wallace walking towards their back door. Good evening, Mr. Wallace. Have you heard anything? Anything unusual? No. Why? What happened? We heard you nothing. I can't get in. Both back and front doors seem fastened. Well, I'll try them again. If it's no go, we'll try my key. Yes, yes. Julia wouldn't be out. She has such a cold. It opens now. We'll look round inside. I'll wait. Julia! Julia! Go out and see! She's been killed! When the police constable came, he saw the body of a woman lying in a twisted position in front of the fire. Her head had been battered in with eleven heavy blows. Round her shoulders was a Macintosh that seemed to have been tucked in, as though the body were a living person that somebody had tried to make comfortable. The Macintosh was partially burnt and stained with blood inside and out. Is this your Macintosh, sir? I've missed Wallace a Macintosh like this. Take it up and have a look at it. It's a gent's Macintosh. If there are two patches, it is mine. Where did you leave it? Hanging in the hall. And then on the forces of the law took charge. They invoked the aid of Scotland Yard. There was blood on the walls and furniture. But the splashes were concentrated in front of the chair on which stood the violin case. Yes. What do you the jokes? The deceased had been sitting on the chair, her head a little forward, as if she was talking to someone. Wouldn't the violin case be in the way? Not if she was sitting on the front of the chair. Was there blood on the seat? I didn't see any. Of course, you made a careful search of the whole house for blood stains. There was nothing on the carpet outside, nor on the stairs, the banisters, or the floor of the bathroom. The only blood stain I found outside the sitting room was on the edge of the pan in the bathroom. Oh. Any blood on Wallace's clothes? No. I examined him pretty well. His boots, his hands, and the bottom of his trousers. Yes. You made a thorough examination of the windows and doors. Yes. There was no, no sign of any possible entrance by force. The police took three statements from the bereaved husband. Dissatisfied with these, three detectives paid a call on Mr. Wallace, who had that night to make this lamentable entry in the diary, which he had kept for several years. February the 2nd, arrested and charged with the willful murder of my wife. And yet I would not willingly have hurt a single hair of her dear head. Julia... If it should be that you and I meet in the great beyond, we can meet knowing that no wrong has been done between us. This man did what he's charged with. It is murder foul and unpardonable. Few more brutal murders can ever have been committed. This elderly, lonely woman literally hacked to death for apparently no reason. For no reason. That was one of the strong points the defense made. Every witness who went into the box testified to the affectionate terms... The Wallaces were on. But moreover, as the defending counsel pointed out, there was never any suggestion of another woman. No hint of any financial trouble or of any gain or advantage to the prisoner from his wife's death. Another point in his favor was that while the parlor was spattered with blood, a pint and a half it was estimated, there was no stain on the prisoner's clothes or person. The recorder of Liverpool, however, had an answer to that. I suggest to you that whoever did this deed was taking elaborate precautions. The history of our criminal court shows what elaborate precautions people can take. One of the most famous trials was of a man who committed a murder when he was naked. A man might perfectly well commit a murder wearing a Macintosh, as one might wear a dressing gown, with nothing else on to which blood could pass. And if he was very careful, he might get away. The defense would have none of that. It is said that my client tried to burn the Macintosh because it was his. That would take time, would it not? I am not an authority on the burning of Macintoshes. Hmm, then let us come to another matter. The theory has been put forward that this was done by a naked man wearing a Macintosh. I heard the theory. Whether clothed or naked, many splashes of blood would fall upon the assailant. Yes, I would expect to find them. On his hands, face and clothes, and his hair, I should expect that. It was suggested that the defendant went and had a bath. 
Did you see any signs of a wet towel of any sort? No, there was no suggestion to me of anyone having recently taken a bath. Wallace's demeanor after he'd found the body of his murdered wife came in for some adverse comment. It was abnormal. He was too quiet, too collected. He was not nearly as affected as I was. I think he was smoking cigarettes most of the time. Whilst I was examining the body, he leaned over and flicked the ash into a bowl. A point you may find more mysterious is, why couldn't Wallace open his front and back doors when he returned to that silent house? The prosecution suggested that those doors were never shut and that Wallace waited till somebody came to witness the discovery of the crime. The whole incident of Mr. Qualtrough's telephone call and the search for a non-existent men love east excited the recorder's skepticism. Members of the jury, you may think it curious that a total stranger to the prisoner speaking from a place 400 yards from his house should have rang up the chess club. You'd have thought he might have called at the house or left a note at the house. Neither of these things happened. But this stranger with the name of Qualtrough rings up and leaves a message that Wallace is expected next night to call on somebody he doesn't know at an address that she finds doesn't exist. And the recorder went on to comment on the surprising volubility of Mr. Wallace, that reserved, studious man, who led him to discuss his private affairs with two tram conductors, a passing clerk, a policeman, and a girl in the newspaper shop. While the remark that he was a complete stranger in a district where he could be proved to have taken five violin lessons suggested to the critical-minded that the whole quest for men love East had been undertaken with the sole object of establishing an alibi. Well, at last, Wallace entered the witness box to give evidence in his own defense. Throughout the hours of examination and cross-examination, he spoke deliberately, giving due thought to his answers, never once losing his calm. How long have you been married? Just over 18 years. What were your relations with your wife? What I should describe as perfect. Is there anyone in the world who could take her place in your life? No, there is not. Have you got anyone to live with now? No. Or to live for? No. Hmm. Let us come to January the 20th. You told the police what you did. Did they come true? I gave them a perfectly frank account of my movements for the whole of the night. And when you found yourself in Menlove Avenue, where did you go? Down Green Lane. I knew my superintendent lived there. He had given me violin lessons two years before. I rang the bell or knocked. I couldn't get an answer. Now listen to me, Wallace. On the night of the murder, do you know where your superintendent was? I've heard him give evidence that he was at the cinema. Did you know it at the time? I did not. Did it never occur to you when you couldn't find men love East just to look in and ask him? I've given evidence that I knocked at his door. Have you ever stated that to anyone before today? Uh, I think I volunteered the information to the police. I've looked through your statements and I cannot find it. Of course, now you realize the importance. At last, Mr. Wallace's ordeal in the witness box came to an end. He answered every question with precision and composure. He even studied the rather horrific photographs of the parlor with a kind of detached interest. But even that man of iron must have felt some relief when his counsel took over the burden of his defense. Because it is realized that this motiveless crime presents almost insuperable problems, it has been suggested that the crime was committed by someone in a state of frenzy. This, members of the jury, was no sudden frenzy. If the accused did this thing, he casually did it all at least 24 hours before. For the prosecution's case stands or falls on the authenticity of the telephone call 24 hours before. If he did not send that message, he was an innocent man. Has the prosecution even started to prove that he sent it? The other vital point was, when was Mrs. Wallace killed? The arguments from the Rigor Mortis of the body were inconclusive, but the evidence of the milk boy, of his friends, and of the paper boy showed that Mrs. Wallace was alive at 6.30, probably 6.45. And Wallace would have to commit the crime, get rid of the blood, break open the cabinet, dispose of the money and the weapon, walk 20 minutes to the tram, stop, and be seen on the tram at 6 minutes past 7. The judge summed up in favor of the prisoner. He, too, stressed the time factor and pointed out how much needed to be done before the prisoner was seen completely dressed and perfectly composed on a time car 20 minutes journey away from the scene of the murder. No motive whatever had emerged from the evidence. Nothing concrete remained which would point to the murderer. The jury, ten men and two women, filed out to consider their verdict. 
And gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Was he right? Would that have been your verdict? The prisoner at the bar, have you anything to say why you should not die according to the law? I am not guilty. I don't want to say anything else. And that's what he said. But in these cases, the jury is likely to have the last word. Likely, but not uh, inevitably. Public opinion was divided on his guilt. When the news came that he had appealed against his sentence, prayers were offered in Liverpool Cathedral for guidance to be given to the Court of Appeal. The third obvious fact is that the case is eminently one of difficulty and doubt. The case against the appellant was not proved to that certainty which is necessary to justify a verdict of guilty. This appeal will be allowed. <laughs> After a few months, attempting in vain to pick up the thread of his ruined life, he moved to Cheshire. His diary was his sole companion. He said, This last few days I've been depressed, thinking of my dear Julia. I seem to miss her more and more. I'm afraid this will be a very lonely winter. February the 26th, 1933, two years after the murder, William Herbert Wallace died a natural death in his bed. A curious thing I'd like to tell you. I was in Liverpool the other day. I had to wait for a train, and I took a cab to the cemetery where Wallace was buried. The sexton helped me find his grave. He told me an odd thing. Grass had been planted on the grave several times, but it would not grow. I saw that for myself. Odd, wasn't it? I wonder if there is anything in the old belief that grass won't grow on a murderer's grave. Anyhow, until next time we meet and I tell you some more of the secrets of Scotland Yard, just uh, think it over. (laughs) 